all for, for joining us. Like I said, please interact in the chat. Um, we're excited to have Melissa here and joining us and Paige as well from our CS team, but I'll let Melissa just kick it off with a quick introduction. Sure. Uh, so my name is Melissa Stahlbomer. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions for New Student Success. Um, I work at Missouri Western State University. It's a smaller regional school um, in St. Joseph, Missouri. So I think our St. Joseph is about 70,000 um, and we've got between four and 5,000 students. So it's kind of a gauge on the size. Um, I have been in this role and a role very similar to it. I just got a little bit of a title change, but um, for almost two years. So two years have been wild because the first one was learning and the second one was COVID. So <laughs> also learning. <laughs> and before that, I come just uh, straight from grad school. So lots of new experiences for me. Um, learning with the times. Lots of things. I feel like, Melissa, you have fast-tracked all of your learning based on when you uh, when you joined. So you're, like, actually five years in if you really think about it. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm going to go with. And I'm going to have all this experience in my extremely quick time. <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, I'm Brittany McFadden. I'm a UPE here at Unibuddy. Um, before joining Unibuddy, I've been here about a year and a half. I worked mostly in Welcome Weekend Orientation Student Life even did a, a, a stint in housing, if you can imagine what that's all like. Um, but excited to be here today and talking a little bit more about live events, and I'll kick it off to the fantastic Paige. Hi, everybody. My name is Paige, and I'm Customer Success Manager here on the Unibuddy team. I am coming up on my year with Unibuddy, which is super exciting. Um, but before that, I worked in higher education as well, just like Britt. Uh, I worked at both UC Davis, which I mentioned earlier. It was my alma mater. Um, and I worked at Willamette University, which is a small uh, liberal arts college in Salem, Oregon. At both of those institutions, I managed ambassador programs, so that's part of the reason why I'm I'm super excited to be here with Melissa to chat with you all about managing your student ambassadors, working with them for virtual events and all of that good stuff. Um, and I do work with a good variety of our partners here at Unibuddy. Um, so I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about what you're doing. So in terms of uh, agenda, um, we just did the, the kind of introductions. We'll walk you through kind of just overall marketing insights that we see as it relates to peer-to-peer -to -peer and ambassador programs and Unibuddy as well. Um, the state of virtual events in 2021, they're not going anywhere, I don't think, anytime soon. So always want to learn a little bit more about that and how our partners have, you know, the impact that our partners have seen from implementing student voice, aka their current students. And then from there, we'd love to just have any questions, quick Q&A for Melissa from Paige, who works with a bunch of our partners, um, feel free to ask us any questions. So uh, research, and you know, I feel like we, we all know this, how important it is for students to interact with current students. Melissa, as much as you know about Missouri Western, students don't necessarily always want to hear from you, right? They want to know someone who's actually in their shoes. And that makes a huge difference in terms of their sense of belonging and how that builds confidence. So we know most students are using social media, are looking at your Instagram, looking at your website in addition to see how can I interact with your current students. And ultimately, they need that reassurance, especially these times. They might not be able to come to campus or it's just a different world out there for them. So for them to get that reassurance from the people that are currently in the shoes they will be in makes a huge difference. And we're seeing that with Unibuddy and we're seeing that with our current partners day to day. So ultimately we wanna make it as easy as possible for prospective students to interact with your current students. I spent a lot of my day looking at university websites and it's not always the easiest to navigate. And of course the student can reach out to admissions folks and we know you would love to hook them up with current students. But not every student wants that. Like not every student knows that they can do that, right? They're a little, they can be a little shy about that. I know that when I was working work in orientation, students would never ask questions. It'd always be the parents. So sometimes they cannot be as forward as maybe we want them to be. So how can we make it as easy as possible? And that's embedding it right on your university website. We know that's the stop that they're gonna go to learn about your university. So why not make it as easy as possible? And let's move away from email. So the way that we like to do it is we let the students choose and they can just get responses from us through SMS texting. So they don't have to worry about going in their email inbox, um, 
you know, students don't always check those as regularly as we would like, um, or they can choose SMS texting or the mobile app. So really trying to meet the students where they are and not necessarily what we might do every day as staff, but how do they interact with their friends and their peers and keeping it that way. And Unibuddy Live, it's what we're on right now. Uh, one of my colleagues likes to say it's the, the answer to Zoom fatigue. Um, I like to say it's, you know, it for me represents more of what an open house would look like with different breakout rooms that students could go to and, and the flow of the day. So trying to make it as interactive as possible and putting the burden on us to be on video, but not necessarily the students if they don't want that. So we're working with over 400 institutions all across the country. You might see we have folks here coming from the UK. We have some of our teammates in the UK. So we are looking to, to expand here in the States. We have you know tons of partners here. And I know Paige will talk a little bit more about what other partners are doing that might have a different profile than Missouri Western. So I'll stop sharing my screen because we're just going to jump into some questions. And as I said, just feel free to ask us any questions as we move along. But Melissa, can you tell us how you got started with Unibuddy? You have one of the quickest turnarounds in like our company history. So so walk us through it. Walk us through that timeline and you know how you got launched and everything. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, in my past role, was... Um, in charge of planning our weekend showcase event. So kind of that weekend campus visit. Um, here in Missouri, we took a little bit time of time to take uh, the pandemic seriously, I think. Um, but the minute we did, it was like that flip. There was no wading into, and I think that's the case in a lot of places. Um, so I think it was mid-March or something like that. It was about three weeks before I was hosting this weekend showcase event. I was concerned about it but then one day I got told all right we're moving virtual figure it out I had three weeks oh um, <laughs> that's giving me like anxiety for you just in <laughs> retrospect yes, and this was in my first year here at this campus yeah, um, it was very special uh -huh. totally uh, but um we were looking for some options we started looking at maybe having to use zoom and things because we'd already have these structures set up we'd had you know, faculty who were going to come and join us. We'd had different speakers. We'd already advertised what this day was going to look like. And of course, people would be flexible, but trying to figure out how to move what was an in-person event to the best possible online event um, to be similar was what I was looking for. Um, our communications person in the admissions office um, mentioned that she'd heard something about Unibuddy, thought it could maybe work. Um, she sent me a link to uh, either set up an overview or watch one of these webinars or something or other. And so actually us getting introduced to it, we were looking specifically for the event platform. Um, I didn't find out until actually talking with the customer service um, folks that they also have the awesome like buddy cards, which is, I think, what it sounds like where, where it started and kind of morphed into other things. But we started looking at the live platform. Um, so we took kind of that first week to get ourselves onboarded um, and figure out, hey, is this going to work? At the time, um, Unibody was doing a uh, free trial, which helped us out because our budget was nil. Uh, so being able to try it first really helped us out um, in getting people on board quickly. I think that would have been the drawback potentially is convincing people. Three weeks would be difficult, but because it's free, we got to start quickly. Um, we got ourselves onboarded in that first week, and then we spent the next two weeks kind of designing a um, website platform that we built all of the Unibuddy features into. Um, we hosted a fair using the Unibuddy Live platform that we got to have, still have those faculty members in, still have everybody in. Um, so those next couple weeks, we, we spent time learning, but also teaching the other folks. So I felt pretty confident after that first week that I understood the programs well enough to be explaining it to external folks. Um, I think because of the times we were in, people were still pretty confused and unsure, but um, we spent those two weeks kind of training, setting up that website, and it, it went, over, went over pretty well. Even that first event, um, we've used it a lot since then, but that first one, there weren't any huge hiccups, which was amazing. Um, I was so stressed for it, and it just it went over really smoothly. So, low well, attendance compared to the 200 people who signed up for the showcase when it moved online, but we still had probably 40 people in that first one, I think. So, 
for switching to an online and saying, hey, still come, even though the world is chaos, mm -hmm. worked out pretty well. All things considered, I would say so. Yes. So I know you talked about kind of training yourself and other staff. Talk to me about the ambassadors and their training. And did you already have a well-established ambassador program? Were you Was this something completely new and foreign to them, this kind of chatting and live events? Right. Well, through that part. Um, so we have a ambassador program for our um, campus tour guides, um, and they're kind of, a lot of them hold different roles within our admissions office, so they're familiar with talking with students in various capacities, not just the tours, um, but we did have that tour program already established. We were already kind of worrying, because we, um, we pay our ambassadors with scholarships, um, so we'd already given these scholarships. We're panicking going, we can't take this money away from these students, but they've got a half a semester left. What are we gonna do with them? And this was the great answer for that. Um, we were able to take what they've learned in giving tours and what they've learned in all of our trainings to really easily switch them over to also doing this virtual platform. And we've kept that throughout. Um, even though we do have small tours back on campus, um, they're still doing the unibody things. They're still helping with our uh, weekend campus visits and just instead of giving those tours specifically, they're also answering these questions. So um, we were able to get a online training set up with them really quickly. Um, and it, it walked them through it. They all seemed to catch on really, really quickly. Um, I think it was great that anybody offered that time for the students to join on in a conversation. They got to ask the questions. It wasn't me asking questions and having to train and figure out how to explain to these students whenever I was unsure um all the students got to ask questions straight to unibuddy and i think that helped a lot um i recorded that or i was provided the recording and i got to use that um, for any time we onboarded new students and i think everyone has typically been pretty easy to use it they they miss messages every once in a while that's probably the only concern but um since i can see those on the back end i get to remind them and that's really the only hiccup I've ever seen with the students, they caught on way quicker than the faculty and staff that we had help. That does not surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. No, not at all. That's pretty <laughs> true across a lot of platforms. <laughs> yeah. I think, did you have a question uh, for Melissa from the CS side of things? Um, so I actually just wanted to tag on a little bit of information about the way that we see other universities doing their ambassador programs, too, because I think it's really cool that you mentioned that you have scholarships for your student ambassadors. That's a super creative way to kind of figure out how to incentivize your students and things like that. But the great thing from at least the CS perspective is that we can kind of see the full gambit of the way that, you know, universities incentivize and you know thank their ambassadors for helping out on the platform so we do have partners that utilize a volunteer ambassador kind of plan and that is fantastic it can work really well especially when you set strong expectations at the start so that the students understand kind of what they're getting themselves into what you want from them and all of that good stuff uh, and then we also see universities that actually do pay their ambassadors by you know the hour or by the time that they spend on the platform too so it's great because it's a super flexible way to be able to really understand you know how how you can help your ambassadors do what they do best, which is talk about your university and be big advocates for you at the end of the day. So it's awesome that we get to see that across the board. I'll touch on that too. Um, yeah. Primarily use our student ambassadors who have that scholarship already. Um, but we did host, people loved the virtual platform so much that we hosted one uh, in collaboration with our international center. Um, and for that, we just found a couple students who were familiar with the center and they volunteered i gave them same training they were actually uh, i think several of them were not even in the states they were elsewhere because it was craziness um and they were able to pick it up and still were on and were helpful and we're really excited to be able to answer those questions and be involved in that way so i definitely see the volunteer aspect working um, for different strategies for sure yeah that's such a cool idea. I love bringing in other departments, too. I think that's a really great way to kind of 
spice up your, you know, usual cast of characters mm-hmm. that you may put forward in a virtual event and allow, you know, different kind of opinions and thoughts to come into those events as well. That's a very like conscious and thoughtful thing to do. I love that. Yes. And I wanted to ask, I know you said they, they, they loved Unibuddy Live and, you know, we, we use, there's other web kind of streaming things that folks can use. So Melissa, on, on your end, why Unibuddy Live versus a basic kind of live streaming or web streaming kind of platform? For sure. I think um, some of the things that I find to be beneficial um, are, one, that you get that data from the students. I think once they get familiar with Unibuddy, once they've logged in and it's it's easy that same way every time there's no pre-registration for anything, which I think you see a lot in Zoom things and other platforms where they have to get that information to get in so you don't have all the crazy people in there. Um, being able to get all that data is really nice to be able to see who's logging on. Then they're already started with your platform, already started with Unibuddy, so then any of the other integrations, any of the, hey, do you want to keep chatting with these students who have been sharing their answers? They're going to post their specific links. You can keep that conversation going. And because I have those ambassadors working year round, once they're done with the live event, hey, maybe they talk to Caroline and Caroline has given great answers. She's a nursing major. Some of our nursing majors can click straight to that link and talk to her later. And I've seen that happen. I've seen um, being able to share if they have questions about the band and that student isn't on that call, I can share that. And they've already been set up in that Unibuddy profile. So it just makes it a lot more seamless, I think. Um, And then also having the different chat rooms. So if people get a little bored with whatever is streaming at the current moment, um, they can pop out, ask questions other places. So you could have different groups that kind of meet the different needs and uh, able to let the students kind of steer their path a little more, which I think helps. I love that idea of kind of using the Unibuddy like profiles almost as business cards in a way. I know when Mm -hmm. I managed student ambassadors, we actually had like physical business cards for them. And you would have thought that we were giving them like little pieces of gold. They loved that. Um, But in this virtual space, you can really take that idea and run with it and have, like you said, have your ambassadors drop their individual links into the chat before the end of the event and really encourage the students that they're connecting with to continue that conversation. And that's something that we really highlight here on the Unibuddy side of things, the importance of, you know, the ambassadors understanding that sometimes it can take a lot for a prospective student to ask a question, even in a virtual space like this. So allowing them the opportunity to kind of be like, okay, I have this other question that I maybe wanted to ask, but was a little embarrassed to do so in the big group. um, And now I can do it just to you. So that's a fantastic use case, I think, for the actual buddy cards themselves. Awesome. No, I like that. I like the business card piece too. That, that, that brings me to how did you get the word out about the Unibuddy live events, but also the ambassador program? I know when I was kind of going through the slide, we, we want to be on the university website because we know that's where students are going to land, but sometimes it can be hard to navigate to find the information. So how did you make sure that your prospects were able to actually find your Unibuddy page and, and chat with your ambassadors and join those live events? Yeah. Um, so a lot of our live events right now, what I've utilized it for are for some of our standing programs. Um, so the recruitment towards those events are similar to what we would have done for a typical campus visit, you know, emails, reaching out to them. It's incorporated into the whole whole event. Um, and then we also ended up utilizing it for yielding students through our orientation events. We used it a ton through summer orientation events still giving that orientation leader back and forth. So those were all kind of your regular, getting the word out, typical processes. There's no real hoopla about trying to get people to come to an orientation. Um, But I think for the other platforms, I think that has been um, probably one of the bigger challenges, if I'm being honest. I think we've started to utilize the integrations, the pop cards, the chat bubbles on all of our um, first year programs pages making sure that other people on campus are on board and allowing me to put them other places has been kind of the process. I think with everything being nuts and all the things happening all at once, finding the right tables to be at to explain the importance and making sure you're watching some of the analytics that you get, some of the things that Unibody provides with all of these different webinars and things to be able to really 
sell it to the decision makers who tell me if I can put it on the front page, who tell me all these things. I think we've used, utilized it in other ways, such as using those uh, individual student codes for their buddy cards during live events. Um, I've also created business cards that they hand out after a tour that have a QR code that send them to the whole buddy platform. So yeah, they kind of explain yeah. at the end of their tour, they say, hey, they write their name on it, hand it to them and go, hey, I had a great time on your tour. If you think of questions or if you want to talk to other ambassadors that maybe have your major or you have other questions that weren't things I could answer, here, check this out. Um, so we've kind of tried to be creative. I think it's definitely an ongoing challenge of trying to get it in front of in front of prospective students' faces because there's so many things being thrown at them for sure. But um, it's been fun to be creative with it and figure out new ways uh, to get people using it. I love that idea of having just, you know, an actual physical business card too. Clearly I'm like hung up on business cards today. I just think maybe like I'm, but I just think that's so fun. It's such a nice way to have a tangible thing for mm -hmm. students who've been on a tour to be like, oh, right. I can actually go back and talk to this person again. And like Britt was saying, it's outside of an email. It's just like I'm texting my friends. So it's like not a big deal in terms right. of actually encouraging them to want to do that. Um, one other thing that I've seen a couple of our partners do really well is integrate Unibuddy into their Instagram accounts as well. So I know a lot of um, admissions offices will have, you know, at their admission specific Instagram. And we have a few partners that will actually create a Unibuddy highlight on their like on their Instagram, um, which means that it's there for any student who goes back to take a look at it. Um, and they'll do the same thing that you do with those types of shareable links where they'll say, you know, hey, if if they have enough followers to do that, like Instagram influencer swipe up thing, they'll link directly to um, to the platform. But sometimes it's like, here's the link for this student and they'll video them giving a quick introduction to themselves, their major, um, their favorite thing about the institution, all of that good stuff. And then they'll just save it in the highlight there for um, anybody who comes by the Instagram, which is always cool. See, and here's the other great thing about Unibody is I'm currently writing that idea down. <laughs> I feel like I'm always getting ideas. So <laughs> I love it. This is like the idea factory right here. We're yeah. giving each other a lot of good good fodder to take to other partners as well. I think with with the campus visit and the, the ambassadors being able to hand out that card is you know, so you're, you're taking a campus tour, you're taking in so much information that they might get home three hour drive and be like, Oh, we, I have these seven questions that like are now coming to me now that I've processed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can be like, all right, Brittany was my tour guide. They gave me their business card. I'll just ask Brittany. They seem like that, you know, they were good. We were having this chit chat and this back and forth. And and what we see with, with some of our partners and Melissa, I'm curious if you've seen it too, is students will start talking to an ambassador throughout the whole process and continue to go back to that same ambassador. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could kind of, and I know that it, it kind of warms the ambassador's hearts a little bit when the student ends up enrolling. enrolling. So I don't know if your ambassadors or you had any, any stories like that, that can continued engagement. Yeah, so my most recent story, um, we had a student that reached out to a couple of ambassadors uh, close to November, um, and he's an out-of-state student, and as a small regional, we don't have a ton of out-of-states. We have some, but not a ton, um, and he was really trying to reach out and talk to some students. One of the students he really connected with, um, they talked back and forth, I think it was like 23 messages between November and then all the way up till January. Um, that student was coming to visit in January, and because they kind of had that back and forth, um, the student was able to be in the admissions office when his tour came. So he was said hello. They got to like connect a little bit. It wasn't his official tour time, but he did get to say hi. And I think that that was really really impactful seeing the students be able to have that conversation, that back and forth. He got to ask a lot of questions. The questions and answers kind of got longer and longer because they built up being okay with answering questions. I think that's definitely the coolest one I've I've noticed. I don't always notice because they have, you know, conversations are always going on, but they'd mentioned that there was someone they were really hitting it off with. And that's just awesome. They got to talk about all kinds of things. I think I haven't, that student is accepted, but we'll see if he comes. Um, I hope he will. I think that's an awesome, an awesome win story. That is so heartwarming. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> it's definitely the story that I'm going to be like 
decision makers. <laughs> Exactly, especially when that student actually comes on campus, because we're going to speak that into the universe for you. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Putting those vibes out there for sure. <laughs> uh, well, Paige, I know that Melissa, they had a kind of a, a built out ambassador program, but there are some schools that, that don't have that or it's in a transition phase. Uh, and Melissa, you can chime in here too, but what, what advice do you have for a school that's either reshaping their ambassador program or they're just starting from scratch? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that I always think about when I think about building an ambassador program, it's kind of what I was mentioning earlier, the importance of setting the expectations for your ambassadors and also for those decision makers that Melissa has been talking about as well, right? You want to make sure that everybody is really on the same page about one, what the ambassadors are going to be doing, two, the hours that you want them to be holding, and three, kind of what the outcomes for you as an office are going to be. And if you have a strong set of expectations, that's going to set you up for way more success than just kind of being like, well, I guess we'll get some students and we'll just have them do some stuff and it'll be fine, right? Um, so deciding that is a very strong place to start. And then here from the Unibuddy side of things, I mean, I mentioned earlier that I was overseeing, I oversaw two different types of ambassador programs. I saw, oversaw a 120 person tour guide program and then a smaller like 30 person, um, very individualized type of team. And so if you are a Unibody partner and you're a little bit lost as to where you would start, what you should do. Uh, we are always happy on the customer success side to help kind of guide those intentions, figure out what types of expectations are realistic for you. Um, and so, you know, I love talking student ambassadors. I think I could do it just nonstop all day. So if that's something that my partners ask of me, I'm always very happy to like consult for them, if you will, and um, give them some ideas and let them know what what I've seen from other schools too. So we're here to help however we can. <laughs> and I would just echo that. I think if you're trying to start something, reformat, if you're stuck, I think one of the biggest resources has been the customer support. I think, you know, in admissions, you start working with a lot of different people. I think Unibody has shown me some of the most support and it never feels like selling and pushing things. I get to hear about ideas from other schools. If I had concerns, I feel confident. I could be like, can you look into this for me? Are there any other schools? Ask them, put a bug in their ear. <laughs> um, and I think finding those solutions, it's really felt like teamwork. So I'm just. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yes, good to hear. And it's helpful that, you know, most of our CS team, like, um, like Paige, have run ambassador programs directly themselves. So with a lot of folks within Unibody coming from that higher ed background and actually kind of running the programs directly, I think that also adds to it and helps because they get it, they get the struggle, but they also get, you know, how you can overcome those certain challenges. I wanted to hop down into the chat. We have a question uh, for you, Melissa. What are your plans for future events as you start to incorporate and adjust to going back to your kind of regular cadence of in-person events? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, my plans include continually including those Unibody buddy card links. I think I want to QR codes. All of a sudden, everyone knows how to use them because they've been Isn't on that wild? restaurant tables. <laughs> um, so being able to have some of those, you know, throughout or say we have a student panel, you know, in an in-person event someday, we could have a QR code in front of each student. They can connect with them that way. Um, I would like to incorporate it in a lot of those ways. I think that online events will stick around. Um, I think that there is a, even at a small regional school where a lot of our bread and butter is people from really close that can easily drive to us. Um, I've seen a lot more diversity in who is attending our events with the virtual platforms. Um, just last weekend, we had someone from Atlanta, Georgia in our visit and welcome where did you like what yeah, we've had a lot of people you know, all over the place we had an international event and we had people from different countries and that's just not something that i can achieve in an in-person event um especially being where we are in just the middle of the country it's not really a place people want to drive all the way to it's not a visit destination um so that's been really great i think we'll continue to have it incorporated into those virtual things, but using some of those things to keep that conversation going for our live events in person. 
that's what I'm looking for in-person events. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can just tag something on to the end of that too, I spent some time when I was working at a university as a recruiter. So I would go out and be like that road warrior person, if you will. And I always really wished that I could bring a student with me, right? Because there were some questions that you know, I just couldn't answer. Like, I can't tell you exactly what the student experience is like because I was not a student at this institution. And so I think a real strength of a virtual event like this one is you could have the recruiter hop on to a Unibuddy Live event and bring a student ambassador with them and send that link out to everybody that you visited while you were in Texas and just be like, I wasn't able to bring the student to Texas with me, but I'm really excited to introduce you to them now so that you can have a good chat and like understand what it's like to be a student from Texas at this university. Um, and just like you said, I believe we could then, you know, drop that buddy link right in the in the chat and encourage them to continue the conversation afterward as well. So I think there are real strengths to the recruitment process that can be kind of added to this this new new normal, as everybody likes to say now, um, that we'll move into after things have settled down. I completely agree, Melissa. I love that you you said, you know, you're able to pretty much put a, a wider net, right? Reaching that student in Georgia. And that's what the, the access and more students having access to different universities is something I've been really excited about. And that's why I hope that the virtual events piece continues to stay. And you know, it, it allows universities to reach students that they might never have spoken to and same for the prospects as well. So I'm also hoping that that, that continues and we continue to see a little bit more of that. Um, I know we talked about there are certain questions that you as staff just aren't able to answer. Most equipped is the student ambassadors. Melissa, I'm curious, what kinds of questions are your ambassadors getting? Does that change depending on the time of the year? Um, and then kind of do you look at the, the types of questions and use that to either retrain ambassadors or send out particular marketing and things like that. Curious how you how you use that information. It's a good question. Um, I think because of the way we've used the platform, because we have used it, you know, both having that general always available ambassador, but also we've used it with our orientation leaders um, for those summer orientation events. So I think those questions obviously look a lot different than um, what our ambassadors get on the daily from wherever i think during events one of the things that was a surprise huge benefit was if students are confused um, in a virtual event or lost or a button isn't working we caught those immediately instead of not knowing things were happening or losing a student to the abyss and they didn't know where their advising appointment was and oh great well they never went um so them being able to ask that question to their orientation leader or to a student who they don't feel as bad you know, asking those questions to and don't feel embarrassed about calling. I know there's kind of an aversion to calling sometimes. So that was super helpful. I think that's been the surprise exciting thing for any kind of virtual event is catching the lost souls. Um, and then I think, um, I think during the live sessions in the chat boxes, definitely more conversational. It seems less like Here's a specific question. They talk back and forth. We were even able to incorporate some things during orientations that that were really more just about social connections. So we set up some chat rooms with specific interest areas. I was hoping with that yield because they could find students who were similar to them. So that was cool. I think as far as um, the general questions that they get online as a student ambassador randomly from the website or wherever, a lot of times it's more specific looking for something specific to that student, uh, that major or something like that, or really student experience like what's it really like to be a student what a scary question to answer <laughs> as a student that's so broad uh, but that's probably the biggest one i see is just asking what's this really like or what's the what's the nursing program really like so it's not just that website information it's not what a professor is going to tell you it's what a student's going to tell you i think that's been the most helpful I think this generation is also very savvy, Melissa, exactly what you were saying in the sense that they know that sometimes, you know, the beautiful shiny brochures that they get in the admissions office may not necessarily tell them the full story. And so they want to get the real information. They want to go to a student and be like, tell me legitimately, like, what are the professors like? Who's been your favorite and why? And yeah. I think that's something that, you know, 
only a student can really answer that question because we as staff members have never sat in on that lecture. We can't tell you, you know, oh yeah, they're great. Or we can tell you that, you know, like they're a nice person. I like talking to them, but I've never <laughs> taken a class with them, right. you know? <laughs> so I think that's very true. And one thing, Britt, just to go back to the question that you initially asked, Melissa, I've seen a lot of institutions really kind of take a second right before yield season starts to re-up the training that they do with their ambassadors. So really encouraging, you know, maybe a like quick webinar with your student ambassadors to do like a Jeopardy style game where you just quiz them on the facts about campus that they should know or things that they need to be aware of, like with COVID protocols or anything like that, just so that you as the ambassador manager can be super confident um, that, you know, you're actually getting the information cr across correctly from your ambassadors because heaven knows sometimes I forget things. Nobody's an encyclopedia, so you just got to re-up that. And I think that's smart based on decision makers, too, if you're concerned about people being, that's one of the things I'm getting blocked up on is, oh, are they going to be able to answer all those questions right. that are from the website? And like they do on the tour. Yep. <laughs> we trust them to do it on the tour, tour right? Um, the backup with, hey, I've done this training and this training, and this is what yeah. I'm doing to make sure they're prepared. It's super, super good idea. Um, we got a, another question here in the chat for, for Melissa, again, very popular. Uh, have you heard from any students who have voiced appreciation or feedback on the fact that they don't have to be on camera during events? Uh, this seems like a huge job for those who might be shy or more introverted, but still are interested in participating. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I've gotten any specific feedback, but I do see some of, like, for instance, in some of the chat-based conversations that our orientation leaders and ambassadors did, um, I do see some of the students who are a little more awkward when they're on screen shining a little more in those areas, um, being able to continue those conversations a little more. Um, and then I think as far as the students, I feel like in hosting virtual events, as I'm sure you all have Maybe also notice, I feel the longer we get into this virtual events, the more often when they are in a Zoom platform where their face is showing, their camera's off. They are not interested in being seen. And they figured out that we can just turn it off. So I think from the student side, my guess is they probably enjoy that a lot. From the ambassador side, I see some shining more. I see some not loving that they can't be on camera because they shine a little better in communication. But you just have to notice or you have to learn your students and know which ones to put on the live stream and which ones to put in the chats. I think that's such an astute observation, right? Because like as the ambassador manager, it is your job to know that exact information, like who's going to be great on camera and who would really prefer to just like be behind their, their screen, just tippity typing away and like having a great time. So I love that you've acknowledged that. I think that's something that is very important to yeah. also. A small tip, if you go with these platforms, one of the things I've found helpful for some, especially in that conversational chat, occasionally I'll plant a student, um, have one of my ambassadors be a student, and they sign up and they help start conversations. Yes. Because um, I find that the first few minutes of any live event are pretty dead because they are scared <laughs> to talk. Uh, but as soon as my my uh, Sarah Smith goes in and <laughs> that helps a lot and people start talking so good old Sarah Smith we love her <laughs> so helpful so I, I hope it's always in another <laughs> you know, they usually pick so sometimes it's it's different things <laughs> we had a Natalie we had a Sarah we had a Katie I love that. I mean, that's very true, though. It's one of the things that we touch on in our Univeni Ambassador training is really utilizing your empathy muscles as much as possible and recognizing that for prospective students, like even though maybe not doesn't seem super intimidating to type a question out, once you've got the floodgates open, like they're going to feel way more comfortable to actually just be like, okay, this isn't, this isn't like a quote unquote dumb question. This is something mm -hmm. that, you know, another person might ask. So we love empathy. Empathy is great. <laughs> it's like being the first person to dance at a party, right? You got to who once starts to crowd the, the dance floor. So I think that's a really smart tactic there. Um, Sandra, another question for you, Melissa. Uh, were faculty members involved with your event? I think we touched on this a little. If yes, what was the feedback that you had from them? Yeah, 
Um, so we've actually had a ton of faculty involved, and um, we've had them involved in a lot of different ways. When we first started, we had them in that um, virtual um, the fair. It was as if they had their table, but it was all chat rooms. I think that first one worked really well because we had a lot of students. Um, they're, they work very confused at first. I had multiple Q&A sessions open to folks where they could ask questions. Once we got them on board, it was a lot better. Um, I think there was some confusion over, you have to sign up first so I can put you on the platform. You can't just log in because then you're a student and it looks weird. So don't do that. I think that was confusing. Um, I think we've kept utilizing them. I think it just pretty much is using them more and then knowing when and when not to use them. So we've seen some events where we tried having a lot of faculty in those chat rooms and it, it didn't work as well. And then the faculty feel a little bit like, ah, I spent a lot of time not getting questions. Um, so tailoring that, I think the smaller amount of faculty you have, the more conversation you get. One of the sessions, as soon as we got the um, live streaming, we had a faculty member live streaming and talking about what it's like to be a student and then a few faculty in the chat who could answer questions more specific to majors, um, but still having that interactive with the video, I think that helped a lot. I think the faculty have felt better about those small groups because they really get to talk more. Um, and then moving into now that we have paneling options, being able to have those different conversations. So I think Unibody has continued to grow and continued to meet the needs of what works best for faculty. I think the students have, it's worked for the students all along, but I think it's continued to grow for utilizing staff and utilizing faculty. We've done both. And um, we've had our Dean of Students, we've had different faculty members, and I think it's all worked pretty well. People are getting more comfortable with the virtual things and there's just more features every day to be using, so. Well, and I think what you touched on there is something that we see from a lot of partners where you just really wanna be very intentional about encouraging the faculty members to practice, practice, practice before they come on to the platform because heaven knows if it's the first time you see it and you come on here and you're like, what the heck is going on? It's not gonna be super great. And so much like when I managed events at the universities I worked at, you know, we would have like briefing sessions before the event itself. You want to do that for your virtual events too, because it allows everybody to feel really well informed and comfortable when they do mm -hmm. come to the platform to be like, okay, I got this. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I also offered some suggestions. Um, so I did screen recordings to show them how to log in, but I also offered some suggestions of how to use what things they're comfortable using. So they're used to being able to hand out this you know, rack card or show their PowerPoint or whatever. Um, so offering kind of using your creativity as the event planner, as the person who has the vision to say, hey, here's a way you can use a Google Drive to do a similar thing, or here's a way you can use this certain product to do a similar thing. And I think that helped them feel like more comfortable. I and love that. That's so smart. So smart. Melissa, we might need you to write that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but for faculty involvement, because I, I know yeah, you know, I already have it halfway done. So <laughs> record the videos. You got it all. Got it all planned out. But uh, Paige, I'm curious because obviously you work with a bunch of different type of partners. I know that depending on the institution, faculty could be super involved in these type of events, and then other schools. Um, good luck, maybe trying right. to get on a panel. So. How have other partners involved faculty um, into whether it's, you know, you know, a lot of events, particular things or major open houses, stuff like that? Yeah, I think the key is really being, as an event planner, keyed into the faculty members that you have on campus. Because I know that there are going to be those superstars that you know, like, oh, if I ask this faculty member to come in, they will smash it every single time. And obviously, you don't want to, like, overburden those faculty members by asking them, every single time. Um, but if you do have a live event that you're maybe just the tiniest bit worried about, or you know, you're like, oh, I can't find a person who's gonna come in and do a great job, knowing that you have those go-to people is a really strong thing to be able to do. And then also even looking sometimes outside of the faculty and into your student activities representatives. So if you have folks from like clubs or if you have folks from athletics that would be willing to hop on and participate, that can make for a really nice, well-rounded event as well too. Um, and then also, if you have members of your financial aid office that would be willing to hop on and do financial aid presentations or things like that, that can be absolutely invaluable in this like virtual event space to really bring them in and 
have that be part of all of the good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot about the other departments. You're right. I know we have some folks that will use the staff tab on their buddy as a complete department for students to reach out to. Yeah. We have a, a question from Paul. Melissa, have you found that there's an ideal time slash day of the week for events? I would say that probably depends on your audience. Um, most of our live events have been on weekends because that's what we had published and when we're going to do visits. I think we've started to have more um, school counselors reach out and ask for things like panels because we're not able to do those in-house visits, um, not being able to have those counselors in the school. So I think I can see us moving more towards having things for specific schools and working with counselors to offer those virtual events because it is technically an event. You can have all the students log in, ask their questions as they come, but it's still that streaming. It's still that we're here, we're here to talk to you back and forth, but we're getting all that information which is great. Um, so I think it really depends on your audience. If you were wanting to do something in collaboration with someone, uh, I think that'll depend. Uh, we started doing some things on weeknights that I would like to, again, I'm trying to pull everyone into the Unibody universe instead of using all the nice <laughs> products. Um, but I think it's just getting people on board and understanding your audience and when they're gonna tune in. Um, Saturdays have worked decently well, um, but I'm sure there are other options. I think especially when you're working specifically with a school or a uh, community college, someone you're kind of partnered with already, mm -hmm. having that, knowing what works for them. Definitely. And I know that you are going above and beyond in terms of helping faculty, planning things out, but one of the biggest questions we get is, this seems like a big lift. We, you know, we're stretched thin, we don't have the bandwidth. How much time would you say you spend, if it's easier for you to do it monthly or weekly, kind of on your buddy, working with it, making sure things are going smoothly? Yeah, I would say to operate it at a level that works and that is still a good resource is really hardly any time at all, except onboarding the students. Um, once you've got people onboarded, I think that that part is the bulk of your time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then weekly, daily, I wouldn't say I even get on Unibuddy probably daily unless I'm informed of a problem. I'd say once a week I check in, look around at conversations, make sure there aren't any unanswered things. Um, if it's right after an event, maybe more. Setting up live events, it's like a breeze. Um, it's a form that you set up. Once you figure it out, it takes no time at all. You can copy past events. So if you have a template kind of a setting that you want to use typically if you want to have maybe each uh, academic area or academic college do their own you can have that same template copied over really help them almost run their own event you you probably have to be there to help um set up the system but being able to have them kind of have that same thing it's really not a hard process because it is such a template based thing that they give you the tools to set it up easily um, i would say with the caveat I think the time that I, you could spend more time to make it live to its fullest potential. I think that I love the creativity, I love getting to come up with ideas, but I would say our numbers are not where I want them to be. Our numbers are not where leadership wants them to be because you do need a little more time to be able to really see it flourish, I think, and incorporate it and convince people. But I think the day-to-day -day operations, apart from trying to grow it, are not difficult at all. It's a very simple process once you figured it out. And also just to tag on for a plug for my department with CS here, like that is part of our job with our partners is to really drill into what you want to see from the platform and make sure that we're providing you with ideas and concepts and things that you can do to help like get to those goals essentially. And so that's what we will be there as your partner to do with you. Um, I want to be conscious of time and kind of looking to the future, plans for the future. I know if you're like me, I'm like, I can barely look past this month. <laughs> um, but we're going to try for the sake of uh, today's um, live event. Uh, where do you see Unibuddy kind of sitting in 2021 for you all? What are kind of the plans for the future? I know you talked a little bit about those, but do you have kind of a, a wish list of things that you're looking to do differently or implement or tweak or anything like that? Yeah. I think um, if I had a wish list, it would definitely be 
hopefully with the world settling down slightly um, and being able to get some of those conversations I want to have, continuing to incorporate it into the areas I see it as valuable. I think being able to come to these webinars, being able to come to all the different things, seeing all the great things that are happening, I know how much value it can have. I think for 2021, I'd like to see my whole campus see what value it could have. Um, introducing it to other partners, not just admissions, because I think it can be used across campus. I think if we had people from, if we had student ambassadors from every single office that weren't the technical tour guides, but maybe they want to just talk about, hey, if you're a biology student, I want to talk to you about this. Um, I think being able to incorporate it all over the website being able to offer those live events to work with work with different departments, different areas to use the platform with my assistants to really make it excel. I think that's the biggest thing. I want to keep incorporating it into events, whether those are in person or not. I talked a little bit about that with the QR codes and things, but my biggest goal is to get people more on board, continue to just make it do what I know it can do uh, from my perspective and make it do it for more than just admissions with the goal of, you know, ultimately bringing in students, but working for all departments to do that. <laughs> it's everyone on campus's responsibility. So that's, that's okay. true. I mean, that is the truth at the end of the day, right? Yes, and I think it's been cool because faculty have been so nervous about it because of the state of the world and mm -hmm. student, student interest is kind of how do they help when they can't be in person? How can they help with recruiting? And this is a great tool to teach them to use, to be able to, they themselves help us. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I know we got five minutes left, so if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. But Paige, I want to talk to you because you talk to tons of our partners. What are folks doing to keep their virtual events engaging? I know for all of us, these are the most virtual events we all have been to in our <laughs> lives. Um, so you know, they can get a little, they can feel a little stale, a little routine. But have you heard of any kind of? you know, cool things that other partners are doing to keep their virtual events engaging? Yeah, I think it really goes back to that creativity piece and really trying to think about the things that are unique to your campus, things that, you know, you do at the end of the day that are really exciting and things that students and, you know, even prospective students who haven't applied yet want to know about. That was part of the reason why I asked about the um, spring traditions at the beginning of the call, just because, you know, we all three of us work at different institutions and we were able to say these, you know, very different things that happened at our schools that we worked at. And so highlighting things like that, really encouraging, um, like I said, to pull in different departments from across campus is a fantastic way to make your events stand out and appeal to the folks who are going to be most likely to come to your university at the end of the day. Um, and then on top of it, I think just being very conscious about the fact that um, students are in dramatically different headspaces when it comes to the COVID situation. And so really being conscious of the fact that virtual events are not going anywhere and that they are going to quite likely follow us um, far into the future. So capitalizing on that as much as possible and making a strategy for it into 2021 and 2022 um, so that you're not kind of left in the dust as other universities do that. Yes, definitely. I think a lot of, you know, you're able to be proactive now. You know that virtual mm -hmm. here. I think, Melissa, you talked about kind of the three week turnaround being new. Um, we, we don't have to worry about that anymore. But now I think, Paige, what you're saying, what's the long term strategy? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do long term? What's not going to be a band aid fix? What can totally incorporate for the future as well? Um, Melissa, do you have any kind of top tips too as well in terms of keeping your virtual events engaging, you know, having students still be interactive? I like the the Sarah Smith um, thing. That's I love that. That's, that's a great that's, tip. That's, that's one of the things that I've thought of is, is definitely using your resources, using your students. Um, I think making sure your students understand how they can help guide conversation, um, even if they're not that planted student, even if they're just the ambassadors, knowing how to phrase questions to continue the conversation. Um, sometimes they can ask them in a way that's especially on the virtual platforms where it's very abrupt and it's like, oh, okay, there's no open-ended part of that. Um, so I think making sure your student ambassadors and even your faculty, if you're using them a lot, faculty or staff, helping give them some tips on 
how do you continue those conversations? Because it's very easy to shut things off, a lot easier than in person to shut things off. So I think making sure they have that guidance, um, using your resources with your planted students, keeping things fresh. Um, I've changed, I think, every single weekend campus visit to a different strategy every time. That's more out of necessity, but it's been good to keep things fresh, to keep them moving. It never feels stale because it is new every time. So I think just keep being creative. And I think everybody knows that that's what we've got to do. But I think Unibuddy is a way to do that for sure. Awesome. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end right there. Um, Melissa, thank you so, so much for joining us. I hope uh, folks on the call took away some tips uh, from you. And it uh, sounds like you wrote some stuff down as well, Melissa, that you learned. Um, <laughs> so that's all good. Um, yes, thank you everyone for joining. If you have any other questions, if you're here on this, someone invited you in some type of email. So reach back out to that person if you have any questions and uh, have a great rest of your Thursday, everybody.